We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given us to study your word at the beginning of this year, 2013. We thank you for my young friends from different church backgrounds, working in different companies from different parts of the city of Hyderabad, who have taken time to come to our home to learn your word. What a joy, what a privilege, and what an opportunity that we have as we go into your word to understand, Lord, what your word has to say on the holy habit of prayer and fasting. And as we try to see things from the perspective of the Google generation, I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us. And at the end of this message, help us all, Lord, learn, have a willingness to learn the holy habit of prayer and fasting and practice them in our lives so that our lives will be transformed. And uh, Lord, and several people will be, Lord, blessed in and through our lives. We thank you, Lord. We ask all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, okay, I just I just read uh, an interesting piece of statistic that in every minute there are ten thousand pieces, ten thousand tweets sent every minute. Uh, ten thousand tweets every every minute. Now uh, we live in a world which is basically trying to communicate with each other desperately through the internet uh, through, through the through uh, online services now for such a generation to understand a thing about prayer where, which is communicating with God you know it's not e it's not easy you know it's not easy there seems to be a disconnect here now when I when we talk to young people about prayer some of them have a communistic view of prayer. <laughs> Uh, about the need to connect with God, which is what prayer is about. They have a communistic view of prayer. They say, okay, uh, people who are weak-willed, they need prayer, not me. So prayer is like a, a, a crutch, a walking stick. I don't need that walking stick called prayer. A weak-willed person, a person who can't manage things on his own in his life, for such a person, prayer is needed. And then some of some people have a cinematic view of prayer. No, probably some of us uh, we cannot forget this uh, scene from one of the most watched um, Indian movies of all time, which is DDLJ, uh, where uh, uh, Shah Rukh Khan goes into the temple, uh, goes into a church uh, just after Kajol and says to God, "God, I don't really need you, but there's a pretty girl who walked into this church and she's asked you for something, and whatever this girl has asked you, please answer her prayer. But I don't need anything from you, God. I'm okay." So some people have a cinematic view of prayer. But it is my passion in the, in the next one hour or so to explain to you the scriptural view of prayer. I'm going to you know, bring very basic lessons. We're going to go back into the Bible and we're going to learn some basic lessons and I believe God will speak to us. Now, first of all, I want, I want us to understand uh, that prayer is supreme. Prayer is supreme. Now, shall we... Uh, shall we read Acts chapter 9 verse 11 prayer is supreme or prayer is num should be number one it's very important in other words Acts 9 1 Acts chapter 9 verse 1 okay what does the what is the first yeah go ahead yeah Saul was breathing threats against the Christians went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus Okay. So that if he found anyone, any belonging to the way, okay. men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay. So Paul, Saul is breathing threats and then uh, he gets converted and then God sends Ananias to him. And what does, uh, what does Paul, uh, what does Ananias hear about Saul from God? Can, can, can you see that? Yeah. So okay. God called Ananias and said, Ananias. Yes. Yes. Lord, he yes. God told him, okay. Go to the house of Judas on straight street. Okay. And ask for a man from the process named Saul, for he is praying. Saul, for he is praying. The first thing the converted Saul did in his life was Pray. praying. In fact, uh, uh, that was God's uh, Facebook update, a Twitter update about. Uh, Saul. No, he didn't put any update. Saul, Saul didn't do any update. But God who knows everything and sees everyone, you know, saw him at that point in time. 
This guy was breathing threats, was now breathing prayer. And God says, he's praying, Ananias, I want you to go and minister to him. I want, and then we see that Paul got filled with the Holy Spirit there. So that's prayer. What is prayer? It's the new breath of a believer. Okay, you know, what is the heart of the Bible? The heart of the Bible, uh, some Bible teachers have said, is the Sermon on the Mount. What is in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus teaching on the on prayer. There are seven references to prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5.44 is just one. Matthew 5.44 is just one of them. Can you read that one reference? Matthew 5.44. But I tell you, yes. love your enemies uh -huh. and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. And then Jesus makes a reference to prayer again in the 6th chapter. 5th verse, 6th verse, 7th verse, and 9th uh, verse. Seven references to prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the disciples never went and, went and asked Jesus, Jesus, how can we preach? Can you tell us how to preach? The disciples never went and uh, asked Jesus, Jesus teaches how to lead Bible study. The disciples never went and asked Jesus even uh, things like, uh, how we can heal this person or, or uh, how we can cast this demon. They said we can't cast this demon, come and help us. But they never really explicitly asked him, Lord, teach us healing ministry or teach us the, this or teach us that or he teaches how to raise funds. He, they never asked him that. But one thing they asked Jesus was, how do we pray? Lord, teach us to pray. Now, the implication is Jesus' prayer life was so impressive, more impressive than other areas of his life that the disciples went and deliberately asked him, this is, if there's one thing from Jesus' life which I want to rub on to my life, and that's what Peter thought, that's what James thought, that's what the, all the disciples thought, it is his prayer life. It is his prayer life. So what am I saying? Prayer, prayer is supreme. In fact, uh, uh, you know, shall we read Mark 3.14? Why did Jesus choose his disciples in the first place? Mark 3.14, shall we read that? Mark chapter 3 verse 14. Then he, selected he selected 12 of them to be his regular companions. Okay, that would be, uh, that would be, a, what version system? NIV. NIV, okay. So anybody using N, uh, King James version or new, okay. Yes, yes, three, 314. And he ordained 12. Okay. That they should be with him. And that he might send them forth to preach. Okay, so why did Jesus choose his disciples first? So that they will be with him. So that you'll be with me. That's the first thing. So that's what prayer is about. Being with God. And that's from that comes the classic quote, which probably have read elsewhere. To be much for God, we must be much with God in prayer. So he said, you, why did he choose 12 people? So that they will be with him. They'll hang out with him. So the, you know, there's a feature I, uh, in Google, which I'm trying to explore. Uh, in order to do my research effectively to interview a few people who are not in India but overseas uh, uh, to try and talk to them about uh, the temptations that they face in the place of work. Uh, so I'm trying to talk with a few people outside of India and then I'm, I'm using Google's feature called Google Hangout. Now Jesus wanted his disciples to first hang out with him and then only go and hang for him. You now somebody has and if they preach and they go to Scandinavia and preach the gospel and they don't like I like the gospel and they hang these guys. I put them into gallows. Hanging for Jesus comes next. Doing, being a martyr for Jesus, preaching for Jesus, you know, healing for Jesus. All that comes this. Next, what is the first thing? Hanging with Jesus. Hang out. Being with Jesus. So, you know, prayer is supreme. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, I, uh, how many of you were born in 1986? I was. I was, I was a 10-year-old boy, a 12-year-old boy. Okay. Not, not, not all of you. 1986. Born, born. born. How many of you are born? 1986. I was born. I, I, uh, 1986, there was a conference. Some of you were not even born at that time. Okay, uh, Billy Graham. Uh, my wife thinks she she exactly knows what I'm thinking. She's true. 99.99 percent. .99 she's true, but sometimes she's not. Uh, it, it, she doesn't know what I'm thinking or what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, 1986, Billy Graham had a conference in Amsterdam. So this conference, you know, some of me, some of you may know people who went for that conference. Your, your mom went? Okay, okay. Yeah, we had some fine preachers of the gospel uh, who went for this conference because he invited many people from India as well. So in that conference, Billy Graham apparently said, I'm going to teach you 
three secrets of successful ministry and successful uh, uh, Christian life. And everybody took the pens out. No iPads at that time. No cell phones at that time. So they, everybody was writing with pen and paper. And uh, Billy Graham, the world's most successful evangelist, the man who's announced the gospel to the maximum number of people in the whole world is going to tell us the three secrets of successful Christian life. And he said, point number one, he said, prayer. He said, quickly, everybody wrote it down. And point number two, he said, prayer. Billy Graham, are you suffering from some kind of disease, which, you know, he is, in fact, right now, uh, where he lost his memory. But at that time in time, no scent of that disease. He said, prayer. And thirdly, prayer again. Prayer is supreme. Billy Graham said it because he's, he has seen all these great passages in the Bible. You know, T.D. Jakes, uh, uh, I believe one of the most eloquent Christian speakers presently alive. No, he said, he said, we can present correct doctrines with hermeneutical and technological perfection, yet they, that he's talking about this generation, the Google generation, yeah, yet it, it, they see us and hear us, but they do not... If, but if they if they do not sense that we have been with Jesus, they'll turn up their backs on our faith and choose a lesser God. Are you calling people into the presence of God you walk with daily or pointing to that presence from a distance? So he's saying when you speak to people and he's speak, especially talking to people in the ministry, then people sense that you they, they, did you have been with Jesus? That you've been with Jesus, you've been walking closely with Jesus. That's the key. That's the key. Max Lucado, uh, the best-selling writer in Christendom said, the highest calling and the greatest calling of Christians is the ministry of prayer. Now, uh, can you can you give me a names of some sins starting with P? Pride. Pornography. Pride. Petting. What about the sin Isaiah, uh, what 1 Samuel 12, 23 talks about? What about that sin? Can you read that please? What about another sin which starts with P? 1 Samuel 12, 23. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. Okay. Samuel was speaking about speaking to the backslidden king of Israel called Saul. And he said, as for me, I will not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. By ending my prayers for you. Sin against the Lord by stopping to pray for you. Prayerlessness is what? Sin. It's supreme. It's very, very important. So a prayer is, you know, uh, a prayer. The, the place of prayer in your life should be what uh, the place of, uh, you know, uh, a doni to an India ODI team. You know, or, uh, or uh, Lionel, Me uh, the place which Lionel Messi holds to the Barcelona team. It should be supreme. It is supreme. Okay. Now, Okay, second thing, I, I can go on talking about this, but I want to go to the second point. Prayer should be, prayer is supreme. Prayer, secondly, should be systematic. Prayer should be systematic, which means we a lot of time for prayer. One of the biggest lies we tell ourselves, there are some lies we tell ourselves. Uh, uh, for example, we, uh, we tell ourselves, uh, uh, I'm not looking, uh, I'm not beautiful, I'm ugly. My, the, my shape of my X, Y, Z is not good. But we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. It's a lie that we tell ourselves. We are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, there's another lie we tell ourselves and that, that lie is, I, let, I'll be praying all the time. When I go in the cab, I'll pray. When I sit in the toilet, I'll pray. When I drive my bike, I'll pray. Every time I pray. So we tell ourselves we'll be praying all the time and the fact of the matter is we don't pray. How can you say that? We, 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 we don't, uh, the fact of the matter is, because of this attitude, we don't, uh, we are not systematic in our prayer. How can you say that we don't pray? Because of this attitude, we must pray all the time. We must pray in the toilet. We must pray while you're riding the bike. We must pray in the cab. But uh, what I'm saying is, if you're going to think that I'm going to pray all the time, 
and I'm going to have an attitude of prayer and I'm going to multitask and prayer will be one of the many multi many, many tasks I'm, I'm multitasking with or uh, you know Supremacy is not you. yeah you, you will not be systematic in prayer Actually, yes go ahead you didn't interrupt uh -huh. So for a couple of months, now I, I remember an anecdote which uh, about Abraham Lincoln when people were his White House staff when they tried to uh, you know contact him for any important matter when they try to go into the room wherever he is working or staying or you know, uh, you know they would often find Abraham Lincoln kneeling down beside a chair or a bed with an open Bible and praying. Here was a president. He had got, he had the biggest job in the world, the job of the president of the United States, and he was praying, deliberately praying, systematically praying. Now we must allot a time for prayer. So, uh, no, yes, we can pray any time, but Nehemiah, uh, for example, Nehemiah prayed uh, between the few seconds the king asked him the question, "Well, how can I help you?" In fact, he had, he, uh, Nehemiah was talking to the king. He said, "The city of his ancestors was in ruins." And the king, he is working in a foreign country and he's talking to a foreign king. The king asks him, Nehemiah, how can I help you? You know, before he could answer, Nehemiah whispers a prayer. So that's a, how, how long will that prayer have, you think that prayer would have lasted? A few seconds? Three seconds? Four seconds? Yes. No, I was, uh, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, question. Okay. There is wisdom in that. There is wisdom in that. Pray, praying early. There is, I'm coming to that. There is wisdom in that. We also pray when she was young. She prayed at three o'clock. Okay. Yes. Yes. You know, we all have our uh, uh, like heart attack. We also have prayer attack. Okay. We'll come to that. I'll come to that later. Okay. Huh? You know, suddenly we want to pray a lot. And yeah, all of us are having. We all of us have some time, and I'm sure you're going to have. I'm sure what you'll have after this message is not a prayer attack, but a transformation of your life so that you will not say a prayer now and then, but become a prayer. Prayer, a person who prays. Okay, now uh, Nehemiah prayed instantly, but again, I want to tell you that look at, look at David, a busy king. Okay, the modern, uh, maybe you can compare him with Barack Obama or uh, uh, Narendra Singh Modi. You know, uh, guys who are sold out to the job and they have high... Uh, they have big responsibility but psalm 55 and verse 15 says a busy king david prayed evening morning and noon okay uh i while i'm talking about prayer i'm also talking about reading the bible because we can the one of this, we can actually the bible is full of prayers we can actually open the bible and read those verses and which in turn becomes a prayer to god so this year uh, you know uh, what i discovered uh, it's not a new discovery but I realize it's very simple to for me to read the Bible Genesis to Revelation. All I need to do is read three chapters of the Bible, Monday to Friday, and four chapters during weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Then I can do Genesis to Revelation. I can give you the maths later. This is assuming the Bible has got uh, 1,200 chapters approximately. It exactly has got 1,189. And then you divide it by 365 and you, you know, all you need to do is you need to do 22 chapters a week and we have 52 weeks we can easily come. so three chapters a day then i thought okay three chapters then i'm thinking my day so i can read uh, i can snatch 10 minutes in the morning and read a chapter then uh, 10 minutes in the afternoon read a chapter i can read it on my ipad i can read it on my in the actual bible then 10 minutes in the in the night i can do it i don't even sometimes need 10 minutes but i can if i 10 minutes i can really read it and reread it and till a message jumps out of that passage and then saturday sunday i can actually uh, do one in the evening as well Maybe David did something like this. He prayed evening, morning, and noon. Daniel prayed three times a day. Daniel 6.10. Now, so, that, uh, so when I say prayer must be systematic, I'm, now I'm inviting you to a lot of time for prayer. A lot of time. Uh, that's where, okay, talking about rising early in the morning, that was Jesus' habit. 
Mark chapter 1, 35, 36, 37. Can we read that please? Mark 1, 35 onwards. Mark 1, 35, 36 and 37. And rising very early in the morning. Rising very early in the morning. While it was still dark. While it was departed, still dark. Okay. He departed and went out to a desolate place. He went out to a desolate place. He prayed. Where he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next town that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. Now this is so crucial. You know, my uh, my f wife and I, my uh, my son Dale and Datasha wasn't even born. We had the opportunity to you know talk with a a man whom God has greatly used in our generation. You know, walk into his office and talk to a man, Dr. D.G.S. Dinakram. That was just shortly after what would be. We didn't know it at that time. His last birthday. So I had the audacity. I was still I was in, living in Hyderabad at that time and. Uh, I was working in a call center and doing this ministry, G4 Mission Ministry, Google Generation Ministry. So I had the audacity to ask him, Uncle, what is the success of your, what do you think is the success, secret of the success of your ministry? And then he was talking about various things and he also talked about prayer. He talked about the importance of prayer. He said, uh, he said, uh, overcoming temptations is very easy. Life. Holy life, overcoming temptations, which is effectively uh, holy life, overcoming temptations is very easy because you are in the presence of God. You are always in the presence of God. And he talked about, you know, uh, he talked about raising up early in the morning to pray, even after having been in the ministry, doing ministry late in the night. He's obviously copying Jesus. He's this is this is not that, that he's not uh, he didn't become uh, he he's just. Copying Jesus' uh, uh, tips, seek, on yeah, tips on successful ministry. And I want to tell you something. Uh, I This is one of the verses I memorized when I was a little boy. Very early in the morning, Jesus got up, left the house, went up to a solitary place where he prayed. But I want to tell you something. This verse is easier to memorize than practice. Why? Why? What is the logic behind getting up early? The logic, uh, you know, the thing is, before you meet with men or meet with people or meet, open up Facebook, seek the face of God. So, you know, I can go on and on. But I want to tell you, look, you look at the world. Now, I read uh, several years ago, this is several years ago, uh, where I, I I believe Chandra Babu Naidu was still the uh, Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, when I when I read this piece about him in India today, it's the, the article said the alarm bells rings at 3:30 a.m. in the master bedroom of 1310 Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. When does the alarm bells ring? 3:30 a.m. And he's in his office by 6 a.m. Couple day. At one point in time, I, I'm not sure presently. Got up at 4.30 a.m. to go for golf practice. <coughs> then uh, I bought a women's magazine for my uh, wife uh, called New Woman Magazine. So that magazine talked about Bipasha Basso. 15 straight years, not even a day she has missed weight, uh, weight training. Not even a day. It was 15 straight years. In fact, uh, I think she got pierced in the belly uh, uh, in between and then he, she said even during those days I'm gonna do some kind of some kind of you know physical fitness training you look at the secular people look at the kind of commitment they have for what they think is important to their life and if the Bible the first point is prayer is supreme if prayer is, should be supreme it's very simple we need to make it systematic in our life you need to make it systematic in our life now uh, I I uh, how do you make a systematic prayer? Uh, you know, you, I just want you to read First Chronicles 20, 25 to 12 at leisure, at home. First Chronicles 25 to 12. Dr. Zacharias has preached a wonderful message on this passage called Who Are You God? You'll find it on, the, on YouTube. Listen to it. It's a good message. But you know, in that chapter, First Chronicles chapter 25 to 12, Jehoshaphat's prayer, you know, there are four steps for systematic prayer. One is 
Adore. How do you? Uh, I'm not going to even read the verse, but I want you to read it and you'll understand. Adore. You need to. You need to actually begin the prayer by praising God. Now, I, I remember a statement which uh, I read in a, in a sports mag about the fielding ability of Jaunty Rhodes. Two thirds of the world is covered by water, and the rest by Jaunty Rhodes. You know, we need to be creative when it comes to praising God. You're the air. I like the I like the song that we, my wife and I, sing it every day uh, by uh, by 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 uh, Jesus Culture. What's that song? I need you, Lord. I need you more, more than yesterday. You know, more than words can say. You know, you need to be poetic. You need to be, you need to just reach down to the bubbles and bring in all your creativity when it comes to praising God. He's the Lion of Judah, the Rose of Sharon, the Wide River of Protection, which no enemy can cross. That's one name we found for God, Isaiah 33, 21. Now, uh, when you read any portion of the scripture, invariably you'll find a new name for God. Pick up that phrase and write it at the, at the back of the Bible and keep using it during your adoration time. Okay, the second is appreciate, appreciate. Okay, appreciate. That is say thank you to uh, adoration is uh, uh, praising God for who he is. He's holy, he's loving, he's living and all that. And appreciation is what? What he has done for me. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the other day uh, in Connecticut, in the United States, 20, chill, uh, 20 plus people died when a deranged man walked into a school and shot people left, right, center. And he shot, and this was a junior school. And one guy who died was, uh, was a guy named Jesse. He was six years old. And uh, he was in the first grade class. And his mother, her own, a single mother, 44 years old, her name was is, is Scarlett Lewis. You know, she would teach Jesse a prayer every day. And the prayer that Jesse prayed, Jesse who passed away in that shootout, not, you know, uh, a few days back. And this is the prayer Jesse prayed. He's, and this prayer is, and this is in People's Magazine. Okay, it's not even a Christian magazine. It's published in People's Magazine. Dear Jesus, thank you for this heartbeat. He's, what? This is the second step of? Prayer, appreciating. Dear Jesus, thank you for this heartbeat. Okay, I know it is a gift from you and you can take it from me, but please don't. This is the prayer that they prayed, the kids prayed. Dear Jesus, you can thank Jesus for many things. Thank you for my heartbeat. I know you can take it away from me, but please don't take it away. What do you appreciate? What did you appreciate God? Now, for in fact, if you look at your life, at least at the end of this day, you can find five reasons to praise God. Five reasons to praise God. Now, I believe I, uh, I think I told you a story about uh, uh, Matthew Henry who got robbed. His purse got robbed. This great Bible teacher, and that day he wrote on his diary, "I was uh, four reasons to praise God for on the day his purse got robbed. I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Point number two." Third, though they took my all, uh, though they took my all, I didn't carry much that day. And the fourth point, I was the person who was robbed, not the, I was not the robber. Any day, good day, bad day, you will always, we will always have reasons to thank, thank God. So I don't appreciate. Then thirdly, admit, you know, heart searching should be part of the prayer. See, there's wicked way, there is pride, there is arrogance, there is secret sin, you know. Look in time and confess. Now, there's a theology that is sweeping through the globe. It says, you know, you're the righteousness of God, so you don't have to confess your sin. You know, you can live as you like. That is a lie from the devil. Don't believe that lie. There are several passages. I don't even want to go into that, those passages. Several passages which encourage us to not only uh, heart search, but weep for our sins. That weeping should not take place necessarily publicly when others can see it. You know, we, we, uh, we may choose to cry, you know, but sometimes when you weep publicly, people call it an emotional stunt. But when you're alone with God in and you're behind locked doors, that's the time to weep. Weep for your own sins and ask the blood of Jesus, ask Jesus to cleanse you. And then finally, adore, appreciate, admit, and then ask, then ask him, then ask him for that Ben's car and uh, that college admission, that US visa and and that baby and you know what not and that beautiful churidar that you show in the shop when you are going in the cab or the car or the bus all that is fine and the husband 
you know, husband who is uh, who is as tall as Amitabh Bachchan, who can talk like Pranoy Roy, and uh, you know who can uh, who can be cool as Dhoni. You know, all, all that you can ask. Uh, no problem. And, I, and then you also have to sign if it's your will. I'm coming to that. <laughs> I'm coming to that. Okay. Prayer must be systematic. Thirdly, prayer must be in solitude. Luke 5. Jesus, where did you pray? Let's ask Jesus. Let's interview Jesus because he is the man who is who is number one in the holy habit of prayer. And his answer will come from the answer will come from Luke 5 16. Shall we read that? Luke 5 16. Prayer must be in solitude. Will draw to desolate places. Okay. Draw to desolate places and pray. Okay. He will he will draw to lonely places where he prayed. And and uh, this passage is five sixteen. What happened just before that? He effectively fed twenty thousand people. Effectively fed twenty thousand people. Okay, five thousand men, maybe five thousand ladies. Uh, even though there was no family planning, we are assuming there are two children. At least 20,000, 30,000 people, he ministered to them and he did miracles for them. And straight after that, what does he want to do? Not uh, just bask in the, the, the glory that he, 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 he can receive glory. In fact, he is God in flesh. So he can actually receive all the glory for himself. But instead of that, he's going to a lonely place to talk to his father who sent him to this earth. Max Lucero put that very well. He said, when Jesus had to choose between the muscles of men and the mountain of prayer, Jesus chose the mountain of prayer. And he says, there are mountains you cannot climb until you climb his mountain. Now, uh, Peter, let's talk to Peter. Peter, where are you? Now, Peter is not to be seen. No, and they say a centurion has come to meet you. A, a military official has come to meet you. And then you look at Acts chapter 10 verse 9. Peter has gone to the terrace to pray. Why, why, can't, why isn't he not praying in the hall? Because everybody, you know, he'd get disturbed. That's why he went to the terrace. He went to the roof to pray. And then let's talk to Paul. Paul, come on, get to the boat. We need to go to a place called Assos. Now, Paul has just raised a dead man to life called Iticus. Iticus dead. Now, this guy got to sleep, went on because Paul went on and on. This guy fell off from the uh, 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 from a building and then he died. And then, thank God, Paul prayed and he got back. Uh, Iticus came up to life. And then, uh, after that, they need to go to a place called Assos. But Paul says, and you read that passage very carefully in Acts chapter 20, 13 to 16. Acts 20, 13 to 16. Paul wants to walk and the rest of the guys go to boat. And then the Bible scholars, you know, analyzing that passage tell us, Paul wants to have a long, lonely walk. And in that walk, he wants to talk with God. A long walk in which he will talk with God. And, my, and, and uh, that's exactly, uh, I, I, so that's why I understand it. Uh, when, I, when my wife says, let's go for a walk, it's not about walking, it's about talking. She wants to talk with me, intimate stuff. That's why she wants a long walk. So Paul took a walk. When others, others, his companions went on the ship, he went, he went for a walk. Why? He didn't, he wants to communicate with God and he wants to hear from him. He wants to hear God's will. And uh, look at, uh, uh, look at Luke six twelve. Luke six twelve. Luke chapter six verse twelve. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. Yes. And all night he continued in prayer. To God. All night he continued in prayer. To God. All night. Okay, I'll come to this again. But all night, why? When others are sleeping, Jesus is supplicating, praying. Prayer must be in solitude. Now, uh, I know it's very, it's not, uh, it's not wrong to write to a, a big preacher to request for prayer. Ezekiah and Isaiah prayed together. We have references. Paul often prayed with many colleagues. Uh, but not at the cost of your own personal prayer life. So, it's a sad fact that many of us who have been believers for many, many years, we don't have this habit of personal prayer. 
it's wonderful you know why does a local church organize 21 day fasting prayer 6:30 to 7:30 every morning at the beginning of the year so that the rest of the year you will do that alone but there's no big fun in just doing it for the uh, with along with the church and you don't transfer that ha- that habit into your personal life to your personal life in fact uh, i've received immense blessings from the lord when i have been regular when i when when i when i've been serious about this happening uh for example it was during uh, when i trained for the ministry in southern Asia bible college I was doing my md there in between 98 and 2001 uh, so when i get free time i would go to the jungles opposite to our uh, college our college was in the outskirts of bangalore bangalore road and you know, if you go to kotno bangalore now where sabc is southern Asia bible college is you can find some huge flats and lots of people but those days when we were, there's nothing there just jungles and snakes in those jungles sometimes uh, no but but I, I went there and i prayed it was during one of those prayer walks that god wrote in my heart that ivan would be my life partner i'm glad i'm glad i i, I heard from god during that times of so during the time of prayer in fact jesus prayed the entire night and then the next morning he chose 12 disciples Luke 6 12 and then 13th verse onwards the his list of disciples come out Jesus God the Father gave him the list perhaps when Jesus prayed when Jesus prayed now uh, now again we also must understand some uh, the other thing the the other side uh, when we when we we don't pray we don't pray uh, spend time praying alone then when it comes to public praying then we can show off and I, I can tell you, I can be, I have been guilty of this sin. You know, that's when when we want to show off, when we want to pray, pray in public. And and, and Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, strongly warns us against doing that. Matthew six, chapter five and six. Shall we read that? Matthew six, five and six. Matthew six, chapter five and six. Do not be like the hypocrites. What is the mark of a hypocrite? They love to pray standing in the synagogues, on the street corners. You know, when you're traveling the metro train, you're speaking in tongues loudly. <laughs> no, I don't know what you do. I mean, uh, or in your cab, you're praying so loudly, you know, and the person next to you feels something is wrong with you. Okay, and then go ahead. I tell you the truth. They have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to the Father who is unseen. You know, I, I, when I look at my the Google generation, you know, this generation doesn't think of, uh, you know, taking a person of the opposite sex and going to the room and locking the door and saying it's not. You know, this is part of life. I mean, what's a big deal? And this is a living generation, you know. They live in and then, no problem. We're not having anything inside. It's, it's just an arrangement. It's just, just commercially saving up some money. No, that's why we have living. We have all those issues. But God says, you go to the room and get alone with me. And talk to me. Talk to me. And this should be a regular habit. Hosea 2.14 is one of my favorite scriptures from the Old Testament. Uh, Hosea 2.14, this is God speaking. It's like a, uh, like a Bollywood hero speaking or a, a Tollywood hero speaking. Hosea 2.14. When God sounds like a hero, a Bollywood hero, a movie hero. Hosea 2.14. Therefore, I am going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. So God wants to actually go out on a date with you. He wants to talk with you. He's got many things to share with you. But he's not going to share it now when you're with a bunch of people. But you need to go alone and hear him. And when I, when I was in you know, I was in Allahabad Agriculture Institute, uh, now training, doing agriculture engineering in between 97, 93 to 97, there were times when I used to go to the mango groves and paste the mango groves up and down and pray. During those times, that's when God put me, put some Bible passages in my heart, Acts 17 and Luke 13, where, you know, the Bible, Bible truth is wrapped around contemporary events and contemporary courts and secular courts. 
and uh, God said, this is what I want you to do. And I said, Lord, uh, regular preaching is putting people to sleep. Uh, what should I do? I, I'm really burdened because I used to go to a chapel and we had preachers and then guys would go to sleep and they would come back and say how boring the message was. And I used to go to the junk mango groves and pray about this and say, Lord, why is this happening? And I, this was a personal talk between, uh, Lord, I don't want this to, I don't want, I want to, I don't want to see this happen. And uh, that's when God said, why don't you be the answer for the, uh, the problem you're talking about, you? So when you pray alone, that's when, that's when you hear God saying things like that. You t tell God a big problem. And God will tell you in that, that personal time of prayer, you be the solution for the problem you're talking about. And I will help you. I will anoint you. I will take, I, I, I will use you. And that's what, and that there in that, in, 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 in that mango groves was sown the God-given vision for grabbing the Google generation from Vienna Mission, the minister that we are doing now full time. So what is the, what's the, what's the, what's the point we're talking about? Prayer must be in solitude. Fourthly, prayer must be specific. Specific. Let's read Mark chapter 10, 46 onwards. Mark 10, 46 onwards. Mark chapter 10, 46 onwards. Yes. Okay. Jesus and his disciples were leaving the city. Okay. A blind man. Yes. So that is the son of Timaeus. Okay. Was sitting by the roadside. A blind man by the roadside. Yes. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. He hears Jesus is in town. He's in the vicinity. He began to shout. He began to shout. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts. He's screaming. He's also praying. So he's talking to Jesus. He's, that's prayer. What is prayer? Talking to Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. So what did Jesus say? Okay. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and called uh, and said, Call him. Jesus called him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. Okay. He's calling you. Jesus is calling you. Jesus wants to speak to you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. What do you want me to do? In other words, you know, I understood this uh, when I was, as a little boy, when I listened to uh, Uncle R. Stanley, I understood this for the first time, you know, that that's, when you read the Bible very carefully, that's what you understand. So what Jesus is actually saying, wh why is Jesus saying, what do you want me to do for you? Here was a, perhaps we can read between the lines. Here is a man who's shouting, son of David, have mercy on me, son of David, have mercy on me. He said, Jesus is saying, you are, you are vague. You're being too general. Have mercy on me. Be specific. Tell me exactly what you want me to do for you. And then he says, the blind man said, Rabbi, Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. And then Jesus, Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Go, your faith has healed you. So, here is a Bible passage which teaches us that we must be specific. Now, I, I want to make an application here. Some of us pray, Lord, bless all the ministries in India. Bless everybody. Bless all the ministries. Bless, all, bless the entire Christian work. Yes, you can pray for that. Uh, pray like that at certain times. But that should not be your regular schedule. But rather, I would like you to go to the website. You now, get the ministries magazine. And you know there are some needs they are mentioned, specific needs they are mentioned. Uh, you know they 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 are going to this uh, particular part of Bihar, and these uh, these goons have come and you know broken the church and you know vandalized the church. You now I felt ashamed when I was preaching, preparing for this quiz earlier today. I didn't realize, I didn't know, even though I call myself a, 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 a current current affairs freak, I didn't know that in Syria, thirty six thousand people have died because of a civil war. And the whole of 2012, I didn't pray for Syria. But how wonderful would it have been if I had knelt down in God's presence and said, Lord, in Syria, so many thousand people, you know, in fact, uh, there are about 200 or 300 people dying daily because of a civil war. Prince of Peace, that's your name, Lord Jesus. Would you not intervene in that city 
I, I, I intervene in that country and bring peace. I'm, I'm, this is a call for specific prayer. Okay, and then when you pray, pray for uh, preachers of the gospel, don't just pray, Lord bless uh, Dr. Paul Denagran, bless Dr. Benny Hinn. No, under, try and understand the problems that they go through. What are some of the problems they go through? Defilement. No, uh, just because uh, somebody is preaching doesn't mean that person automatically becomes an angel. The struggle is there. Pray, pray that they will not be defiled. Pray against division. Now that's one of the biggest causes for the slowing down of the gospel. Division. Pray against defilement. Pray against division. Now pray against discouragement. You know, uh, uh, do you know what? Uh, why Nehemiah often wrote in his book? There are three times or four times you'll read in his book. Lord, remember me for what I have done. You know why? Nehemiah uh, perhaps it, Nehemiah did wonderful things for his people as a leader, but nobody from the people came and appreciated him or remembered him. So he tells Lord. These people have forgotten me. At least you remember me, Lord. So that, no, it's very easy for a preacher to get discouraged and think of an earlier retirement. No, no preacher wants to, you know, uh, prolong his career like you know Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, when, the, when there's a lot of, dis, you know, especially when there's a wave of discouragement, they want to go for early retirement. In fact, if you if you read some statistics coming out of the states, there are many dropouts from ministry. Many people who drop out, they graduate from a Bible college and they are working in a call center. I also did that, but that was for a purpose because I wanted to, you know, connect with the Google generation. But there are some who are no longer in the ministry and they've just gone to a different line altogether. And they're far away from God. So when you pray for a preacher, when you pray for a ministry, when you pray for a person, you know, the least we can do is to actually, you know, try and get that person's name. Get that person's name, man. Get that person's... Understand that person's problem and mention that problem and then pray and pray. So a prayer must be specific. Then fifthly, prayer must be submissive. Prayer must be submissive. Now I don't, I, uh, uh, there is a stream again, it, I don't know, I'm not talking about one particular preacher, but this is a wave and there's a wave teaching. In fact, uh, there was a person in our base a few days back and he was talking about a particular church in a leading Indian city where the pastor says, don't pray. Don't tell the Lord if it's your will. Do this. If you say, if, it's the, if you tell the Lord if it's your will, do this, then you have disbelief. You don't have faith. Now this is crap of the highest order and that is unbiblical. You know what? What, what did Jesus, Jesus prayed like that. Prayer must be submissive to the will of God. Now, I don't even have to even have one Bible verse to understand that. You know why? Because... I am a created being. Are you one? With a finite mind. I, my mind is finite. Is your mind finite? So I don't know every, anything about my future. For example, with my finite mind, when I fumbled in saying two lines or three lines in my stage as a school kid in Ida Scudder School, I couldn't do two lines and three lines even after I memorized the two or three lines for three hours or four hours, I memorized those lines. When I went on stage, I got so nervous, you know, pretty girls all around and uh, uh, nerves knocking and not, not only otherwise, even if all guys were there, I would have got, got nerves. Uh, girls made no difference at all. Uh, I forgot those two lines and I went back as a schoolboy. I prayed, Lord, I never want to get on stage for you. I will sell the preacher's book. I will drive the preacher to the meeting place. I will promote the preacher's a website, I will do all what you want me to do for your kingdom work, but I will never get on stage for you. But thank God for unanswered prayers. <coughs> thank God for unanswered. Because, you know, in your stupidity, you're telling, Lord, I want to marry this guy. Oh, he's so good and he's he's a good, he's, he, he, he looks good and he, he talks cool and he's, a, he's good and he's, he, he, he knows how to make the conversation going and, you know, we have wonderful reasons to believe that this particular boy that we are so head over in hills in love with is the person that we want to marry and we try to arm twist God to, to you know, uh, to, uh, to comply with our will. But you know what? God knows the end from the beginning. Now, you are only thinking about your first night, but God has thought about all the million nights you'll spend with that girl. And he knows what exactly will happen in every night. <laughs> he knows the end from the beginning. So you don't need any Bible verse to know that your prayer must be 
Somebody say, your simple theology. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He is only Shia. So it makes sense to actually sign off every prayer. You know, as you sign out from your Yahoo and Gmail, especially when you do use somebody else's laptop, you sign out. This is the sign out statement. Not let your will be done. Let your will be done. And that's what did a, Jesus did at Gethsemane. And uh, for, let's read Isaiah 45 and verse 11. Isaiah 45 and verse 11. This is God asking us a question. Isaiah 45 and verse 11. Uh, the King James Bible, you know, in fact, uh, has wrongly translated, and the earlier versions of the King James Bible are wrongly Thus translated. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. The one who him. I'm the one who formed him. Ask me of things to come. Ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? Will you command me concerning my children? Will you con command me? That is, that is what is the correct translation. But you know, some old versions says, "Command me." And some some uh, some 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 preachers would take such verses taken out of context from badly translated places from ancient versions, which uh, you know that is not the correct translation. And they teach a do wrong doctrine, saying, "Command God." That's the, that passage is not saying command God. Is exactly opposite the opposite. Do you command me concerning the work of my hands? Do you give orders about my work of my hands? You dare not do it. Now Daniel who prayed three times a day, he says in Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. He does as he pleases with the powers of the heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can hold back his hand. And say to him, what have you done? You know, when I am about to slap Dale, my wife can hold, my ha hold back my hand and say, you dare not touch my son. But I can't do that. I can't hold back God's hand and say, what is it that you're going to do, God? I can give him, I can pray, I can, I can be frank with God, I can tell him what's there in my heart. But I can't. Command God. In fact, in David, David understood this. First Chronicles 17:25. First Chronicles 17:25. That's why there David says, I have been bold enough to pray this prayer. What does David say in First Chronicles 17:25? I've been bold enough to pray. That means what? You just can't walk into God's presence and come give him uh, orders. Give God orders as if he's the he's the waiter in a hotel. I've been bold enough to make this prayer. In fact, there the context is David wants to build a temple for God, but it was not God's will. David wanted to build, is it a good thing to build a temple? But it was not God's will for David to build it. So, you know, you may want to do a do number of things. You may want to have the biggest ministry in the whole world. God will give you the biggest ministry in the whole world if it is his will. Otherwise, it may be his will that you would be in some, some corner, somewhere serving the Lord. The important thing is to be faithful. The important thing is to be faithful. Now, uh, sixthly, okay, what are the five things we learned quickly? Prayer is supreme. <coughs> Solitude, yes. Specific. Submissive to God's will. And sixthly, prayer can be silenced. So, you know, sometimes God says no for prayers. This is just a corollary of this previous point, but I want to stress this real hard. Sometimes God can say no. For example, God can say God will say no to prayers, uh, uh, no to certain prayers when we are when we do it with wrong motives. James chapter 4, verse 3. James chapter 4 verse 3. When we pray with wrong motives. You ask and, not to you ask and your prayers are silenced. Why? You ask amiss. You ask with wrong motives. Okay. You ask out of wrong motives. And then uh, if you are praying without being right in our relationship with people, sometimes God will not answer prayer. Mark 11, 25 and 26. When you stand, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, 
so that your heavenly father will forgive your sins so our relationship with people you know and our relationship with god there is a connection and our answers to prayer there is a connection now first peter 3 7 is a, a, a verse that everybody who's married and trying to get married and read, read everybody married and trying to get married first peter 3 7 especially the husbands yes husbands likewise dwell with your wives with understanding giving honor to the wives as to the weaker vessel as to the weaker vessel as being heirs together with the grace of life yes that your prayers may not be hindered so that your prayers may not be hindered so how you treat your wife has a connection with how has a connection with how god answers your prayers so if you don't treat your wife properly there is a god may choose not to answer your prayer now these are possibilities probabilities i'm not saying every time your prayer is not answered you're not treating your wife well but these are possibilities now uh, i want to tell you something even during jesus's ministry for example uh, he didn't answer all the prayers uh, for, uh, uh, james i believe said james john one of the disciples said lord bring down fire from heaven these people don't believe you did jesus answer the prayer he was silent he was silent you know uh, give them left and right hand seats when you come in glory that was a prayer of the mummy of james and john and the scripture says that they knelt down and prayed this prayer but jesus was, did not answer that prayer jesus did not answer the prayer prayers can be silenced prayers can be silenced i want to make another yes jonas prayer yes okay yeah there are many ans- unanswered then but over 600 plus prayers in the bible and many of those prayers have been uh, uh, god has silenced them god has silenced them then prayers must be sacrificial prayer must be sacrificial or prayer must be selfless now uh, only one of the seven requests in the lord's prayer is a request for bodily needs give us this day up daily bread all the rest are spiritual needs let your kingdom come thy will be done only one to the body needs how do we pray how do we pray we must pray for others that's right so uh, you know jesus in Ma- matthew 6 31 to 33 talks about pagan praying how does a pagan pray unbeliever pray you know he, he prays for my plans my programs my project my partner my health my wealth my worries who prays like that only all the time pagans they are only concerned about these things all the time we must pray for these things but not all the time we must uh, and in fact uh, uh, when we pray for these only for earthly things and when you are only preoccupied god will sometimes answer our prayers in anger in psalm 78 29 30 and 31 psalm 78 29 30 and 31 the bible says when the you now they were craving for meat people of israel wanted non vegetarian maybe it's like uh, uh, in in our present context oh how i wish i can go and and get drowned in a bucket of kfc bucket you know They, they were craving for meat so while the meat was yet in their mouths the anger of the lord rose against them so in fact god gave them the request but it, it, that was not the perfect will of god that was the permissible will of god and the permissible will of god can be very dangerous so uh, in fact uh, what was jonah pray jonah was yeah we are, we are coming to we just come to jonah's prayer vijay Jonah's prayer. Jonah's prayer was for the his plant. He was very particular about the plant that that too not his plant. God gave him that plant, and that plant died. He got so angry and he was that is his subject of prayer, if I can say that. But God's God's plan is not God's focus was not the plant but the planet. Nineveh has got one lakh twenty thousand people, one twenty thousand people who don't know left hand from right hand, which means what is wrong 
they call right and that, that's what i read about this uh, delhi rape case as well these guys are you know for them you know people what do they do on a sunday evening some people go watch movies some people go to kfc some people go, you know go 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 out for a walk in the park but this these guys their idea of fun on a sunday evening is to you know take a moving bus and get a girl in and rape that girl and then throw the girl out what is wrong they call right and what is right they call wrong that was nineveh a sin a city with full of sin and then god says should i not be concerned about nineveh that's my concern that's what's bothering my heart but what are you bothered about all the time your plan your plan i'm bothered about the planet which is going through a moral decay so prayers must be selfless no uh, i think i mentioned this before india has got about 35 36 states we pray for a state today we can cover the whole of india you know every day uh, I'm, I'm God willing, I'm, I, I go to uh, Kolkata and I go to uh, Delhi in February. So then we have a restroom down, down right, right below. Some of you have seen, used it. Now there's a, you've seen some India maps there. So sometimes I think, Lord, uh, uh, I know I'm, uh, I have miles to go before I sleep in my the area of prayer. So I would stop before I go to the restroom, stop for a minute and then look at that map. And I'll think of the next place I'm going to preach. Okay, now this, in this case... Uh, West Bengal and then New Delhi. And then I circle those places and say, Lord, touch touch this place. Now you go ahead of me and you you prepare the ground and you make the hearts of the people soft. And I, whatever comes, whatever comes in my mind at that time, whatever the Spirit of God puts in my mind, I pray. Now we need to pray. We need to not just for you know, not just say, Lord, at least, at least I want a second hand Indica car. No, that that that's a good prayer, but pray for India. Pray for India. Be selfless in your prayers. You know, I, I read about a young girl who uh, who wanted to make a was only praying selfish prayers, and then one day she heard a message about like this, and then she started praying. The next day, she said, uh, uh, and she said uh, she was a single girl. She was praying for a life partner. She said, "Lord, please give my mom a handsome son-in-law." <laughs> Abraham prayed for Abimelech's wife and whose wife became pregnant? His, wife. His own wife became pregnant. No gutbud happened, okay? <laughs> Abraham prayed for Abimelech's wife. That's the story of Genesis 21 and 22. If you read both the chapters together, that's why it's sometimes the chapter divisions are in the most uh, wrong place in the Bible. They are not inspired by God. Genesis 21 and 22, if you read both the chapters, Abraham prayed for Abimelech's wife and his own wife became pregnant. Job prayed for his friends and his own wealth, his own, all that he lost got doubled, except the children. Except, and the wife as well. Okay, I'm not going to go there. Okay, 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 fine, fine. Okay, you got my point. <coughs> Moses prayed for the skin disease of his sister Miriam and God healed her. And then you know what? Moses prayed for the skin disease of his and then there's a place where the Bible says Moses actually his face glowed. No, he prayed for his sister who spoke against him. And Moses actually, uh, you know, uh, there's a place where the, uh, where it says Moses' face was, was glowing and it was and it was it, he was so handsome. And then that that uh, that made Leonard Ravenel write, "Prayer is the great beautician." Prayer is a Great beautician. Okay, now I'm going to come to the, the 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 main the focus the climax of this of this Bible study. Prayer and self control go together. So that I'm, that's where I come to the fasting prayer. Prayer and self control go together. Now I believe one of the first references to fasting in the Bible comes from Second Samuel twelve and verse twenty three. Second Samuel twelve and verse twenty three. David fasts. You know why? His love child, the child that was born to him and Bathsheba, when the time when they were having an affair, she got became pregnant. And then uh, David prayed. He prayed with fasting. Here was David in a desperate situation. Now, he loved, he loved this baby. He wanted this baby to live. In a desperate situation, what does David do? He exercises self-control. He goes without food. Okay, that's that's one that, that's one situation, and then in uh, in First Kings chapter twenty one, 
8 to 10, Jezebel calls for a fast. And that is a fast with a wrong motive. You know what? She called for a fast and when the people came, she got two scoundrels to testify against Naboth who owned a vineyard. A vineyard she he would not sell to the king and the queen. So sometimes we can fast with the wrong motive. Okay, now uh, I know some of you are thinking fasting is not my cup of tea. But I want I want I want I want you to encourage I want to encourage you through a scripture. Read Judges chapter 20 and verse 26. Judges, you say, well, fasting is for uh, so and so, fasting is for pastors, fasting is for preachers, fasting is for people who are preparing messages, but I don't I am not into any of those things. Fasting is not for me, and I have never fasted in my life. You know, uh, if you're saying that Judges 2026 20, is for you. All the children of Israel, all, underline the word, all the children of Israel. That is, that is all, the people. all the people. They went up and came to the house of the Lord. And they sat there before the Lord. And, they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. Until evening. So, who all fasted? Yeah. Everybody. And how long they fasted? Till evening. evening. Now, I want to tell you something. What? Okay, when you sleep, already by default you fast. Unless you are on IV. Drips. When you sleep, that's why we have breakfast. So, you skip breakfast and you eat lunch at say 3 o'clock. What have you done? Fasted till the evening. Is it a big deal? It's not a big deal. That's what they were doing. It's simple. And by God's grace, in a in an imperfect way, my wife and I, you know, we have been doing that for the last so many years. I have lost count how many years. At least for the last decade, every Tuesday and Thursday we do that, fasting till the evening. And God has, you know, God has been, you know, we've got breakthrough blessings. The very fact that, you know, I we as G Formation exist as a ministry. We don't run a church. We don't have church service. We where we collect offerings after every service, and you no. Know, but the very fact we survive and God sends in the finances and people make their online transfer. You now, if there is some secret I can I can share with you, and God is speaking to you to enter the ministry, or you know you're thinking along those lines, I can tell you this: till evening fasting. Not that that fasting made us earn the grace of God. It's still all the grace of God. We don't our prayers don't make us earn the grace of God, but it's just a discipline. Where we, where we just hang in, hang, hang around with Jesus, hang with Jesus, or hug Jesus, whatever you call it, till evening. And you know, I want to tell you something. You now, some of us say, okay, is fasting really commanded in the New Testament? In fact, Jesus, in in in, uh, 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 okay, let's let's read Matthew four two, Matthew four two, Matthew four two. Jesus fasted for 40 days. So through example, Jesus taught fasting. And then read Matthew 9.15. He said, uh, Matthew 9.15, he said, a day will come. Now they don't fast, but they will come when they will fast. So through edict. What is edict? Through a command. Through, from example, through edict. Through example, Jesus says we must fast through edict. Jesus, uh, Jesus says we must fast. And then he even gives exhortations on how to fast. Matthew 6.16, shall we read? Matthew 6.16. And when you fast, do not look. When you fast. Do not look gloomy like the prophets. He assumes you will fast. He doesn't say you. He doesn't even say. In fact, Jesus assumes all believers. All. This is, for, this is the Sermon on the Mount. All citizens of his kingdom will fast. Fast. So that's why he says, when you fast. And then for effectiveness in ministry, Mark 9.29. Mark 9.29 in the King James Version. And this, for this King James Version is very good. Uh, you know, he them, for he said to them, this kind, this, kind, this kind of demon will not come out only by fasting, by, by except Except by fasting and praying. Except by fasting and praying. You know, there are some habits which Satan has demonized. In fact, you remember the story in Mark 5 where the Satan came and chained the guy? 
a, a maniac and he was uh, he was chained by satan and then on top of that iron chains were on him and he was cutting himself self destruction he was cutting himself with stones mark 5 we read that now fully influenced by satan and some of us are into some habits destructive habits you know it could be secret habits destructive habits you know and uh, it could be alcohol it could be pornography it could be abusive language uh, i don't know what destructive language in fact alcohol very much so because you know every you know that is not good for your health cigarettes you know cigarettes are not good for your health you take away it takes away every cigarette takes 5 minutes of your life you know alcoholism you know is not doing any good to you drugs you know they are doing greatest damage to you but still you can't come out why the devil has come and influenced you and you are in a bondage so how do you come out of that bondage fasting and prayer no other way you must do it you've been a believer for many years and there are some stubborn habits maybe your temper or lust or you know laziness you know fasting and prayer so prayer comes along with with prayer goes along with self control and then prayer must be sustained i want everybody to turn around and have a look at that that placard there what does it say prayer must be sustained so don't get a prayer attack after this message okay and then you go for one week and then you forget about it just like a heart attack happens maybe once a day once in a lifetime or some people get heart attacks twice at twice in a lifetime or thrice in a lifetime but must be sustained you know you read amos chapter 7 you no know, amos kneels down and he prays and you know god shows him a vision and he says israel is a small nation jacob is a small nation and then the judgment goes away and then again he prays seven chapter twice he prays for the same thing his amos's prayer for israel or jacob or his the country that he hailed from was sustained So it must be a habit. You must keep at it. You must be disciplined. Shall we close our eyes and ask God? You now, in this new year, in this new year, you now when people will God say, will God put this Facebook update about you? That Facebook update that you would have probably put for Saul, who went on to become Paul. the twitter update that uh, god would have probably put for saul went on to become paul he is praying in acts chapter 9 what would he say he is playing he is facebooking he is twittering he is eating he is preaching she is gossiping what would be his update about you in 2013 and for the rest of your life you need to answer that question i need to answer that question you know think of a time when you'll pray you now you have an android phone you have an uh, iphone you know we have wonderful alarm systems in those phones with some of the most irritating alarms i alarm sirens set set one today set one today i want you to open your phone right now all eyes all eyes open take your take out your phones take out your phones and think of the time of prayer and then set an alarm for that time right now right now 5 o'clock 6 o'clock 7 o'clock i don't know what shift you do 3 o'clock in the morning take out your phone set the alarm to that time and then start off 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes 20 minutes the more you fall in love with jesus then you won't you there will come a time when you won't even look at the clock the joy we shared as we tarried there none other can uh, has ever known so said a hymn writer talking about the time of prayer i went to the garden alone when the dew is still on the morning talks you know he talks about his prayer life he compares a prayer his prayer life to a walk in the garden with a loved one and we talked and he and he walked and we talked and the joy we shared none other has ever known set the alarm close your eyes and start off from today and i want you to couple it with bible reading because there are other passages i didn't have the time to show you you know when god's people fasted and prayed they there were times when they always read the scriptures it was a extended time of reading scripture 
Think of the image of Abraham Lincoln on the knees with an open Bible. Looking up to heaven and praying the prayers of the Bible. Quoting Bible verses in intercession. Quoting from Psalm chapter 2. Ask of me and I will give nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. Lord, I pray that hell will be plundered in, in the company called Dell I am working in. Lord, I pray that hell will be plundered in Dell. Praying, inter making intercessory prayers. Hallelujah. Now, think of maybe this is a very simple way. You know, three chapters a day during Monday to Friday, five chapters during weekends. A small slot, even five minute slot where you'll pray alone, you'll go and you'll kneel down or you'll make yourself comfortable, open the Bible, pray, and also uh, you'll read and you pray. You have no idea how your life will trans be transformed. For one, you will overcome temptations consistently. That's what Jesus said in God some get some name. Watch and pray that you will not yield to temptation. Why are you falling? Why are you yielding to temptation after temptation? Why is why is there no victory? Because you don't watch and pray. Because I don't watch and pray. That's what Jesus said. Watch and pray. So that you will not yield to temptation. At the hour of prayer, you, you get the power which will stand you in good stead when temptation comes knocking. So even if it is the king who is calling you to adultery, you will say no. Even when nobody is watching, because you have practiced the presence of God by praying consistently, you know God is watching you. You know God is watching you. Because you know, that's, that's prayer. Prayer is just celebration of God's presence. So there's no question of secret sin because you know, you are always, God is already there with you. He's putting his arms around you and you're both talking to him. Even though there's nobody else in the entire building. That midnight when you're browsing, and no one else but God is there. No question of secret sin because God is in the room. And you're praying. You're talking to him. I request my wife to lead us in prayer and, and we will close. Father, we just thank you, Lord, Lord, for your word that's come to us this evening, O Lord. Our prayers and fasting, O Lord, thank you, Lord, that you unburdened your heart to us, O God, through your servant Hallelujah. today, God. O Lord, we thank you, Lord, Lord, for teaching us, O God, on prayer. O Lord, this time we ju just join our hearts together, all of us who have come, O God. Lord, I want to, Lord, come with Sister Sandhya, Preeti, Lord, and uh, Lord Arul, and uh, Vijay, and uh, uh, Jerome, and uh, his wife, Dr. Harika, and Lord, Ravi, Kiran, Shashi, Sunil, oh Lord, and uh, uh, Lord Nagraj, and Kiran, and uh, Elias, and all, and all dear ones, oh God, we join our hearts together. Oh God, and we pray that you will pour upon us that spirit of prayer. Yes. Oh Lord, you will pour upon us spirit of prayer, oh God. And uh, Lord, you said, I will pour my spirit, I will pour upon the house of David. Oh God, the house of David, my spirit of prayer. Oh Lord, we are your children, oh Master. Yes. We are your chosen ones. Yes. We are the family of David, oh God. Lord, we pray that you will pour upon us that spirit of prayer, oh Master. Yes. Oh Lord, supplicating, interceding, oh God. Oh Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would give.